Welcome to part five of Team Strike's latest card counting trip. You're joining us in Vegas, where our team is on a hot streak. In this episode, you'll see my dodging back offs plan totally backfire, but then the new approach resulting in an unbelievable amount of playing time and a big pile of chips. So the approach so far has been to avoid a back off. Doing that approach, I only got one back off and that's because I handed over my ID. I think they knew who I was or they immediately looked me up there and then. I'm on blackjack, play whatever you want, no blackjack. The issue is, is that the person on our team Ultimate who has not been doing that, has just been playing until a back off, has been getting more time. And given that there are so many casinos in Vegas, it doesn't seem very beneficial to actually try and conserve casinos and not get backed off. So the new plan is now to play until a back off. I think this is gonna be my last day in this disguise. So I'm gonna do my best to burn out this person so I can change my look tomorrow and get a fresh start. We are currently up. How much are we up? We're currently up 60K, which is awesome. The first two casinos I'd play at today would reveal a lot. They'd show that my lack of back off so far were actually not because I'd slipped under the radar, that the casinos were more aware of me than I thought. I'd be joined by Syntax wearing a lovely disguise that I can't show you. Not because it's a weird disguise, just because he doesn't want his disguise on the internet. I'd be wearing a disguise we've come to call... I was really sick of wearing that disguise. Don't get me wrong, Stone Cold Steve Bridges, he's a cool guy, but there's only so many days that you want to spray hair dye onto your face. <laughs> Until I got a bunch of back offs where changing my look would be advantageous, the disguise would have to stay. Shit, where are my makeup wipes? Oh, f Me and Syntax are gonna go and hit the same casino. The only thing that we've decided is that if one of us gets backed off, the other person will leave. Surveillance departments are less likely to run down two card counters at once. The thing that we're we're trying to figure out is whether or not we play a bit of a six deck, whether we do a little bit of team play where we pass each other the count. Let's just yep. be fluid. We'll yep. figure it out. Yep. Our first stop was Green Valley Ranch, the casino I'd played a day prior where I got some heat but left before a back off. I went in first, Syntax joining shortly after. Damn it, that was a bit of a disaster. I got inside and sat down at the table and then really within three or four hands, someone has to have a word with me. So have a moment talking? Sure. I'm the manager on duty. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us. We've got more blackjack for you. Okay, you can play anything else you desire. I just sat down. Is this true? You did too good for us on blackjack. So I can't have you playing any more blackjack, all right? All right. Play any other game? Any more. other game? Any other game, but no more blackjack. They didn't back me off by name. Maybe they've got some very sharp surveillance people that were looking, you know, just saw me walking in. Or maybe I was recognized. It was very fast. Bummer. Hopefully Syntax would have better results. Syntax had offered to film his session. First day um, playing Blackjack with the hidden camera on me, but I feel actually quite good about it. To draw less attention to himself, he sat down with chips he had already. When you buy in as you sit down, you're a new player. But when you sit down with chips, it feels like you've been playing for a while at another table and you've been prior approved. Syntax was blending in, not drawing attention to himself, which is why he almost immediately spilled a drink on the table. <laughs> at least he felt the adequate amount of shame. I'm sorry, sorry about that. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Good syntax, you should be sorry. Drink spill aside, as with Double Deck, the count changes fast, and Syntax had a true one, upping his bet to two hands of $100. His first hand was a 14, he took a card and had 16. As the running count was positive, against the dealer 10, this is a stand. His second hand, he had 15, took a card and bust. The dealer had 13 and drew to 18, both hands lost. In this round, Syntax bet two hands of around $150. Not good, the dealer drew to 19 and won. He fidgeted with his chips, buying time to see if the dealer change would trigger a shuffle. He wouldn't want to bet big and then take those bets away if the count was being reset. The new dealer immediately announced, calling the pit boss's attention to the two bets of $275 and $200. Syntax asks if he's allowed to double, double implying he's not very familiar with the game. This is nicely paired with the fact that doubling a soft 16 versus a 3 is not basic strategy. Many pit bosses will know this, but they won't know that the true 4 is actually correct to double. So this is well handled by Syntax. It's subtle, but it works nicely. The dealer busting means not only does Syntax win both his hands, but the double pays off as well. $750 in one round, 
I like it. The cow had increased, so it was time for the max bets. Two hands of $400. His 17 and 19 were no match for the dealer 20. Ouch. The running count had decreased by two, but the amount of remaining cards had gone down enough that the true count still called for two bets of $400. The next hand was a fancy push, and the hand after that, he had a nice win of $800. Syntax played on for another shoe, where unfortunately he lost before he was approached. I don't sir. Hey, hurry. Some more blackjack for him, okay? Oh, can I play? Can I play any more blackjack? No, okay. Any game you want, but no blackjack. <laughs> okay. I spilled my beer. You spilled your beer? But it was water. <laughs> <laughs> no, did they realize? I spilled it and I quickly like tried to clean it with my hands because I didn't want them to realize that it's not beer. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. Well done for winning. I didn't win. Just now? No. You won 2k? No, I have 2k here in chips, but I lost $650. Losing money and getting backed off quickly, although part of the job, is never what we're wanting. I can't wait to get rid of this f***ing goatee. Hopefully we'd have better luck at the next casino. Arizona Charlie's. The casino I played at with Irish a couple of days ago. The casino that hadn't backed either of us off. The casino that had actually apologized to Irish for giving him hassle at the cage. A casino it felt like could let us play forever. I sat down, started playing, settling into what could be one of the longest sessions of the trip. They backed me off in less than five minutes. Go to the cage? Why? That confirmed it. The short sessions leave before back off strategy wasn't even working. Twice now I'd gone back to casinos I hadn't been backed off from and was backed off instantly. It was time to play long sessions and welcome the back offs. However, it wasn't all bad news because I did get a high count in that time. I went and had a great few hands. I won two grand, but then they backed me off. It seems that after I left, they must have run down my game because they knew I was there the other night. But now I'm gonna go hit Mandalay Bay. Oh, great transition. I love when that happens. Just to interrupt myself for a second, I get a lot of Instagram DMs from people asking me if they should learn to count cards. Card counting is definitely not for everyone. For most people, it's a terrible idea. But if you want to see if it's right for you, I've put together a free guide called Why You Probably Shouldn't Learn to Count Cards. It's linked in the description. The Las Vegas Strip is a mixed bag when it comes to blackjack. Its biggest benefit is that you can easily walk from casino to casino having plenty of options. However, it's a bit deceptive because most casinos on Strip are owned by two companies, Caesars and MGM. Both MGM and Caesars have strong surveillance departments. And if someone is caught counting at one casino, it won't take long for every casino in that chain to be notified and on the lookout. So in a way, it's more like two really big casinos and then a few smaller ones. Well, if you can call the win small, which you can't because it's probably the biggest. But we don't really care about that because their blackjack is, eh. Point being, MGM and Caesars know what they're doing. I'd be starting at Mandalay Bay. Joe played there already, getting a solid eight deck game with good rules, good pen, and late surrender. Late surrender is a great rule. It allows you to forfeit your hand and lose half your bet. It's a defensive play. Even though there's a right answer according to basic strategy, with many hands, you're still likely to lose no matter what you do. If you have a 16 versus a 10, do you really want to take a chance and hit? Not really, most cards will cause you to bust. But do you want to stand? Also no, because standing a 16 versus a 10, is, it's not gonna go well. The dealer's gonna beat you either way, most of the time. Combined with counting, surrender can save you a lot of money on bad hands, which means more profit overall. Joe had only played at Mandalay Bay for 20 minutes before leaving due to heat, but it was time for me to see how much action they could take. Wow, I'm just, I'm actually really struggling. This can't be all of the table games they have open right now. No shot. I found a free seat at their only open eight deck table and started to play. The pit boss seemed very relaxed, no heat at all. Not that I started raising my bet right away. Unlike with double deck, where high counts come often, with eight deck, you have to wait a while. With my first shoe, I got a very negative running count very early on. So I sat down at the eight deck, started playing there. Count is super negative right now, so I'm gonna have a very, well, I'm just gonna kill time by going to the restroom. There you go, that's a fun update. Eventually, I did catch a positive shoe. I got a 12 and an 18. I hesitated on the 12. 12 versus two is a hit unless the true count is a three or higher. I took a brief glance at the discard tray and judged it to not quite be a true three. So I took a card. Damn. Right decision, wrong result. My 18 was no good either when the dealer drew to 19. I rebought and placed my next bets with a bit of a slam, pretending I was annoyed I was losing, chasing my loss. I wouldn't have to pretend for much longer. My first hand lost, but my 20 was outdrawn by the dealer. What the hell? 
More losing hands, more rebuying. Unpleasant moment here where I bet two hands of 400 and the dealer gets blackjack. Not sure why the theme of this session is my 20s being beaten, but I don't like it. Nice to see that the pit boss sympathizes with my pain. In this hand, I had the opportunity to surrender. At a true four, 14 surrenders against a 10. Yeah. Instead of potentially losing $500, I lost $250. It makes sense because in this specific scenario, the 14 will bust or be outdrawn most of the time. Although, annoyingly, this isn't one of those times. Because the next card out the shoe was a 6. The card after that was a queen, busting my other hand. I did have some nice wins. This round of two hands of $400 with a double and a dealer bust. And this hand with a double and a blackjack. There we go. Needed that badly. But overall, there are a few more losing hands than winning ones. When I got a particularly negative shoe, I decided to wander over to the High Limit Room. I thought it was worth checking out because the rules there would be better. The High Limit Room felt different. This room was dead. Gone was the nice relaxed atmosphere and chill pit boss. They were perfectly embodying this fake formality I've come to hate. An air of, this is Mandalay Bay High Limit, we are serious here. Already, I decided I wasn't going to stick around long. One hot shoe and then out. And as I started to play, I had this strong feeling that they were already suspicious of me. Admittedly, this might just have been because of the contrast between the high limit room and the main floor. Perhaps there was no heat and I was just imagining it. But I also thought I had a good thing going on the main floor, so I risk playing high limit. I may just be drawing unnecessary attention to myself. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Or in this case, if it ain't broke, don't potentially break it. All of this was going through my head as I quickly got a high count and started to bet big. In this hand, I was dealt a 20 and a 10. The 10 I doubled, but the dealer's 19 beat me. Luckily, my 20 won, so overall in the hand, I lost $300. And in this hand, I was dealt an 8, which turned into 18, and a 17. The dealer had 13 and drew a 9, busting the hand. This concern that maybe playing high limit was a bad idea really hit me. There was no way it was worth it. I may have already triggered a back off just by being here. It was time to go back to my safe 8 deck game and hope surveillance hadn't started paying attention to the only guy in high limit who was playing a lot like a counter. Or exactly like a counter. I just played Mandalay Bay for three and a half hours, which is the longest session I've had. Actually, I didn't even get a back off. So now I've just walked outside and I'm kind of on the Las Vegas Strip or on the end of the Las Vegas Strip thinking, potentially I'm gonna go to Treasure Island. However, they're really fast to back off apparently. Oh, I should just do it, it's literally right there. All right, let's try Treasure Island. After realizing I was looking at the wrong casino the entire time. Oh, it's Excalibur. I figured, given the proximity, I'd play Excalibur. Was it wise to immediately play another MGM property given the internal communication between them? But more importantly than that, at Mandalay Bay, I fit in. I definitely stick out more in Excalibur. There are fancy casinos used to big bets and money being thrown around. And then there's casinos on the lower end where a $100 bet would turn heads. Excalibur is somewhere in the middle. It's more family friendly, so it attracts a bit of a variety of players. But in general, if you're a high roller, there are probably other casinos that you're going to choose. Playing a maximum of two hands of 400, I thought I'd definitely be the biggest better on the table. Being the biggest better is not ideal when I'm trying to blend in. But what's the worst that could happen? When I first got the high count and bet big, it could go either way. The dealer announced and really made sure that the message was received. But the pit boss didn't really seem concerned. My 15 isn't great, but given that the dealer had a six as her up card, I was hoping I'd be okay. Her whole card is a queen, and she drew a 10 and bust. I had a good run early on. My hands often weren't great, but I was somehow making it work. When I had a 14, I managed to get a six, which beat the dealer's 18. And when I managed to get two spots, I doubled an 11 and unfortunately got a four. And I doubled my nine to get 19. But who cares what cards I have when the dealer draws a picture card and busts. Winning hand after hand, big bets of green chips stacked high. It feels good to win. I like it. With all those wins, I'd drawn attention to myself. And then I had one of those classic oh no moments. Sometimes, this is genuinely just because they want high rollers to have a player's card. But often, it's a cheeky tactic to get a suspected counter's ID. I was pretty sure it was the latter, and that was confirmed to me when I saw her go up to the other pit boss and have a hushed conversation. As far as I was concerned, that settled it. They knew I was counting. But let's not let this distract us from what a lovely round of blackjack this is. Two hands of $400, one of which I doubled, and the dealer busting her hand. $1,200 right there. I like it. 
In moments where I know a back off is inevitable, I switch to maximizing. I reduce my min bet to the table minimum and even took the liberty of sitting out of hand at times, letting other players play through the negative counts. In counting, saving money is making money. Part of me was looking forward to the back off. It was past midnight, I was hungry, tired, and I've got something like five hours of play in at that time. But incredibly, no back off came. Another hour or so goes by. You might be wondering why I didn't just leave, why I wanted to be backed off. Well, I knew they were running my game down. That I suspected would keep going whether I left the casino or not. In a sense, I was a dead man walking. If I just left now and came back tomorrow, I'd be backed off on arrival. As I played hand after hand, my winning streak took a bit of a hit. I was up easily 5k plus, but my chip stack was dwindling. Just when I was starting to think, I'm too drained to keep playing, I got a text from Irish. I've just left Excalibur after playing three and a half hours, no back off. At one point I got a load of heat, so I thought it's just a matter of time. So I started just being incredibly unsubtle. But I just didn't, <laughs> I didn't get a back off. And I've actually played seven and a half hours today, which for Vegas is awesome. What's annoying is, is that I um, won alone. I was kicking ass for ages and then just didn't, you know, and you know how it goes. But I think I'm, I don't know. I don't even want to know right now. I'll put the number on the screen. Sleep time, I think. The lack of back off at Excalibur had given me a bit of a revelation and a new idea on how best to use disguises that I'd employ the next day. It's time for the team graph. My day had its ups and downs, but that last session took me back into profit. $1,775 up for the day. For the team, the day started off well, hitting a new trip high of 70K. Unfortunately, we had a dip after that, but we still won just under 7K for the day. Recently, I took part in a social deduction game show that is totally different to anything that's been made before. Personally, I love games that involve lying and deception. So being asked to take part in the getaway was a bit of a dream come true. It's very up my street. In the show, I was assigned the role of snitch, which meant it was my job to sabotage challenges to build up my prize pool, while also lying to my fellow players, building alliances, and most importantly, convincing the other contestants to vote off other players so I could make it to the end. The twist, which makes this show so good, is that every single contestant is actually a snitch. We all thought we were the only snitch, the only player who was on the deceiver role. We thought we were special. We weren't special. You'd think the result would be chaos, and it was, but it actually heightened the various deceptive tactics and social strategy elements. The genius of the game design team was designed to show where the premise was a lie, but without compromising on the game itself. But just imagine the pressure that everybody felt in episode one. It's an elimination by vote game. We were all thinking exactly what I was thinking. If I get voted off in episode one, I'm gonna ruin the show. Imagine the dynamic that creates when everyone is panicking about ruining the show in episode one. This show is exclusively available on Nebula, and right now the first three episodes are already online. Nebula also has the entire Beat the Odds series ad-free and sponsorship-free. Each video I post on YouTube is normally on Nebula a week early. Not to mention, there's also some bonus videos I upload there that aren't on YouTube. There's an Untold Stories from Team Strike video, where I talk about some of the things that have happened to our team that I haven't mentioned on YouTube. There's a dramatically lit conversation I had about card counting. There's an interview with a former professional card cheat, where he demonstrates some some of the techniques he used. There's also a chat with legendary card counter Sheriff. He's been tackled to the ground, unlawfully detained, he sued a casino. The stories that he has make my stories seem tame. All of this as well as high quality Nebula originals, podcasts, and Nebula classes from creators. Joining Nebula is a great way of supporting me and other creators directly. Nebula is my number one sponsor, and the support that you've all shown me through sponsors has directly impacted the quality of these videos. Nebula is normally $50 for the year or $5 a month. However, you can get 40% off the annual plan if you use my my link. That works out at only $30 for the entire year. In other words, $2.50 per month. $2.50 per month for ad-free, sponsorship-free videos, extra content, and original shows that would not be possible without your support. Please use my link to join Nebula. It's also linked in the description.